My job is to work with students uh, throughout the district from kindergarten to 12th grade uh, that have a hearing loss. Um, for the younger kids, uh, what I do is um, we work on listening skills, discriminating sounds and noise or with a mask on uh, so that they can better understand when people are speaking to them. And the older students, I tend to spend more time working with them on self-advocacy skills, understanding their hearing loss, being able to communicate their needs and things like that. So it's a lot about awareness. Right, awareness on the part of the students I work with so that they can understand and communicate what their needs are, but also for the people that are working with them because um, they need certain accommodations in a classroom in order to be able to fully access the spoken communication that's going on between the students and the teacher and so they can access their education. Um, those things are things like preferential seating, using FM systems, using closed captions, um, appropriate times, you know, when to use those accommodations and when not to, how to communicate needs. So in an educational environment, if, if there isn't somebody there to help advocate, to help teach how to advocate, then what you see is students um, struggle. In college settings, a th three times as many college freshmen with a hearing loss, and what we call an educationally significant hearing loss, they're three times more likely to drop out of college because um, they may not know how to you know, find social networks, but also they don't know where to go to get services um, that we do provide in school. And there are systems set up, but the difference with college is you don't have a teacher of the deaf or in hard of hearing. You don't have somebody who's doing that legwork for you, who's doing that advocating for you, who's making sure things are in place for you. So you know, in the absence of that, what you see is a lot of failure on the part of those students. So my job is to make sure that they're keeping up and that they're able to um, maintain their progress in their classrooms by having that educational access. Lots of people assume that like I had deaf people in my family and that's actually not true at all. I, when I was in high school, I was a member of the marching band and I very clearly remember as a senior, we had a, a freshman who played the clarinet and she was profoundly deaf and had a sign language interpreter who would come in and would interpret the teacher, you know, what he was saying during um, concert band every morning. And I was just kind of fascinated watching the interaction and watching sign language. I kind of fell in love with sign language. I took some classes. We had a program at that point at, at my high school where I was allowed to go once a week to the Pennsylvania School of the Deaf as an internship program. And it just connected. It just was something I was interested in and I, I applied to the right school. and. 21 years later, here I am still doing it. I worked in Philadelphia, and at Philadelphia I was a classroom teacher. Uh, I co-taught in a room with students who were deaf and hard of hearing. Um, it was much different, A, because I was a classroom teacher, uh, but also because the students that I worked with, um, the majority of them used sign language. So throughout my day, I was signing and speaking simultaneously as I was teaching, you know, uh, math and, and reading and writing and whatnot. You have to have a master's degree at this point and there are not a lot of programs in the state for that. Um, when I went, it was actually an undergraduate program uh, and I went to the Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Um, but at this point, Bloomsburg I think is the only state school that has a program I believe that's still an undergraduate program. Um, St. Joseph's has a master's program where you would specialize in uh, getting a degree in education of persons with hearing loss. There are uh, interpreting positions. Uh, you could be an educational audiologist um, or an audiologist, uh, like a practicing clinical audiologist. Um, those are all professionals that are really focused on um, hearing and addressing the needs of somebody with a hearing loss, whether it be f an audiologist fits people with the equipment that they need, like hearing aids and FM systems. Uh, educational audiologists do that, but more focused on classrooms and, and not just the general population. And then, of course, they, an interpreter, their job is to both sign um, whatever somebody's speaking to a deaf person and the voice for the deaf person um, in the communication exchange. It's not as easy as I know how to sign and therefore I can be an interpreter. Um, there have been a number of occasions where I've been put in a position to interpret for people. And it is a very different skill. Like to, to sign for myself, I know what I'm going to say, so it's pretty easy for me to just start signing. But when somebody else is talking, I have to think about what they're saying and then translate it into sign language. And that's just a difficult skill that I don't really have at this point. I would have to practice more and get um, the 
proper certification to do it. But I, my skills are strong enough that if I put effort into it, I have no doubt that I could do that. And it's a great career path because it allows for a lot of flexibility. Um, a lot of uh, interpreters, unless they're an educational interpreter, which means that they are employed by a district or an IU and they are regularly going into a school building on a Monday to Friday basis, a lot of interpreters do it on a freelance basis. Right, so they get a job, they get paid by the hour, a pretty good rate too, and usually I think they can bill for two hours at a minimum. You know, they might go and do uh, interpreting in a courtroom or a doctor's office. Um, you know, so there's a lot of confidentiality that has to be um, understood and if that's the role you want to take. But you kind of set your own hours. You know, you're a freelancer, and if you want to work on that day and a job comes up, you do, and if you don't, you don't. So it's kind of a nice uh, option for people. Recently, I, I published, self-published, um, a book called Deaf Not Deaf, and I'm selling it on Amazon. And I can remember in seventh grade, I used to write stories, and I would incorporate my friends into them, and I would, I would show them around. And so it's, it's a bucket list item for me. Like, I've always wanted to write. I love to write. So um, I decided uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago, this idea sort of had been brewing for a while, and for whatever reason, I decided to start trying to actually put a book together. Um, I, I went to Temple uh, for a couple years through their filmmaking program. So I, I teach filmmaking in Bryn Mawr every summer to high school students. I've been doing that for almost 15 years now. And so screenwriting is something I'm very comfortable with, but I've never really tried to tackle a full book. And so, um, because of lack of representation of the students that I work with in literature, uh, I decided that it was a good place to start. You know, people say, write what you know. And not only is this a topic I know, it also is a topic that a lot of people don't know much about. Uh, and people who are professionals that work with deaf and hard of hearing students are desperate to find materials that they find relevant for their students. You know, there aren't curriculums for what we do. Everything that I do is adapting materials. Everything that teachers of the deaf do is to take what exists and adapt it for their students. And usually it's a language concern that they're, you know, have to, have to change the language so it's more approachable for the students that they work with. But, you know, in, we, there's a lot of, you know, conversation these days in schools about representation, about diversity and inclusion and cultural proficiency and accepting other folks. And that's something that is really important to me. Um, it's something that as a school board director in my home district, which I am a school board director as well, I've spent a lot of time working on initiatives to make the district that I represent more inclusive, um, not just from a special education standpoint, but culturally, you know, ethnically, religiously, a, a, a better appreciation of the, all the students that um, come into that district. And a big part of that is the materials that we use in classrooms. And can a student identify you know, with the characters that they're reading about. And because there was kind of just a, a real void for the kids that I work with, I felt that it was an opportunity to create something that they, they could connect with. My target audience are um, middle school students, fifth, sixth, and seventh grade, I think is probably really the, the middle grades um, uh, in terms of where the interest would be in, of the story. But in addition to that, it's also um, t educators. Right, because I was saying with these themes that are in the book, I feel like it's a good opportunity to um, have conversations about groups of people that um, regular education students are not typically familiar with, or anybody who doesn't have a hearing loss. Most people know somebody who has a hearing loss in their family. Um, some people know somebody who's actually what we call culturally deaf, where you know they, they use sign language as their primary language. The, the, most of the people that are in their social network themselves are deaf. Um, that's kind of how a deaf person would define uh, culturally deaf. Um, but they still don't know a lot about how to approach them. Uh, there's a kind of an, an uncomfortableness sometimes because of the fact that it's a communication barrier, right? You figure that the way that we interact with each other is to talk. And for somebody with a hearing loss, especially if they are a sign language user, it's very intimidating to try to communicate with somebody when you're not on the same page linguistically, right? So by telling a story through the eyes of two characters that understand deafness differently, right? My one character, Ryan, who's the main character, she has a cochlear implant. And so her, 
her communication barriers are different than the other character, Luis, who's deaf and uses sign language. Um, her issues are probably a little more closely aligned with the students I work with here in the district. I have a few students, as a matter of fact, at Springford who have cochlear implants. And there's a misunderstanding about cochlear implants. People tend to think that, well, if they have it, then they hear perfectly, you know. And I try to weave into the story for people who don't know much about deafness um, information sort of anecdotally that they can take with them when they are working with my kids and maybe apply it when they have them in their classroom. Uh, a teacher that I have worked with a number of years, um, a couple times over the past few years who's reading the book, said exactly that to me in a, in a private message, said, you know, after reading your book, I realized there's some things that I could have done differently with your students. You know, I, I, and that's huge, right, to have that kind of breakthrough and understanding, because I, I work with a lot of teachers and they get a lot of SDIs in an IEP, do this, do this, do this, do this, and it's kind of hard to communicate to them all the time why some of these things are really important for the students that's in the room. Um, so from reading a story from the perspective of the student themselves, and the struggles that they're having in that regard, I hope that it will make it a little easier for folks to understand why these things are so important. And then on the other hand, with Luis, who is the, the sign language user, I mean, there are, I think I, and I say in the author's note at the beginning of the book, there's around 500,000 people, about a half million people in the United States who depend on um, ASL to communicate in the United States. And they are their own very sort of inclusive community. They don't see deafness as a disability. They see it as a cultural identity, the same way somebody with an Italian might. So when they see somebody get a cochlear implant, and this is important to the story, when they see somebody who gets a cochlear implant, they see it as a rejection of, of the deaf community. Because most people who are born deaf are born into hearing families. So to them, it's an opportunity to have somebody be a member of their community. They were born deaf, and in their mind, that means they should be signing, right? The conflict is if you're born to a hearing parent, well, a hearing parent is going to want to be able to talk to their child. You know, and 30 years ago, this wasn't an option, but today it is, right? So you have parents that obviously want their child to hear their voice, that want, to have a, that want their child to be able to speak English. And that's gonna be a lot easier to do with a cochlear implant than if you're learning sign language and you have a profound hearing loss and you're trying your best to just use whatever hearing you may have to repeat speech. So there's kind of this inherent conflict between these two groups of people that are your neighbors, they are people in our society, and most folks don't know much at all about that conflict. And so these two characters, Ryan and Luis, explore how they can develop a friendship and get past their communication barriers. Um, because at first, at the beginning of the story, they don't get along. Luis is very mean to Ryan. He does some things that are, are, are not very pleasant you know, for a new student. It, she moves to Philadelphia. And it's really kind of that school that I was telling you about earlier that I worked at, Hancock in Philadelphia, is really kind of the, the setting of the story. Um, and she moves to Philadelphia and she doesn't know anyone and she already has a hearing loss, which kind of already makes her feel like an outsider. And there's these other deaf kids, but they're deaf, culturally deaf, deaf kids. And they reject her right out of the gate because of the cochlear implant, the quick judgment. The story is told from the two perspectives so that you can kind of get a sense of the inherent bias in each one of them. Um, but as the story progresses, they do start to find common ground and they do find that there's a friendship there and they become good friends. And it's really in the process of another bully who picks on both of them um, without bias um, and they come up with a prank that they want to pull on this kid to get back at him. And it goes a little off the rails and so it really is meant, even though there's these kind of deeper themes, it's, it's a story that's written for 5th, 6th, and 7th graders. It's fun. It's funny. There's adventure, there's, there's ghosts, there, well, there's a ghost story. Like, there's a lot going on, but you know, the idea is that I want students and adults who read it to have fun and learn in the process about these people that they don't know very well. Representation matters, right? Like, it really does matter to kids to be able to identify with someone that they're reading about or whoever's standing in front of them teaching you know these things do matter i had a student a sixth grade student who i gave a copy of the book to i've been with her now for five years and i thought that she would really enjoy the book so i just gave her a copy and in our session i read her just the first chapter just to kind of get her started and there's a line in the first chapter where um, Ryan is asked about her cochlear implant, and in her mind she's saying she's just tired of having to always ans 
uh, answer about her cochlear implant first. People always notice it right away, and it's the first thing that they want to talk about. And when I read that part, right away my students put her hand on the table and said, I hate that. People always ask me about it, right? And she immediately found a connection to this character because of this shared experience. And so, yeah, like that to me is what I want those children to get out of it, those students to get out when they read it, is that hearing loss is a very lonely condition. It doesn't happen to a lot of people. I think roughly 1% of the population, I mean, certainly to a point where it's significant enough to impair your ability to communicate, it's far less than that. And those are the kids that I work with. And I hear all the time, why, it's not fair. Why am I the only person that has to give this FM to the teacher? Why am I the only person that has a hard time following a conversation with my friends? I can't hear what's happening in a conversation in the cafeteria and things like that. So I can't put them together when they're at the elementary school because sometimes there's only one kid at the elementary school. You know, but to be able to have a shared experience with a character in a book, you know, at least helps them, I think, feel better about their situation because it does at least paint a portrait of, you know, you're not the only person that's dealing with this. There are other people, um, you know, and then as they get a little older, I do like to try to group them when they get to the interme intermediate center for exactly that reason. But until that time, they need somebody to connect to. It's really important, and I hope that the book does somewhat uh, tries to approach that for these kids. There's an ebook version and there's a paperback version and they're available on Amazon. You would, uh, I have a website and I do recommend checking out the website because it really is meant to be a companion piece with the book. A former student of mine from Philadelphia, from John Hancock, who's about 18 years old, she recently had some viral success with a TikTok video. She was signing lyrics to songs and the artist, um, that she was signing the songs to shared out her video and she got over a million hits and you know they did a little story on her. So she's great. And she and I worked on a project where I filmed her signing all of this, the dialogue in the book that is signed by the character Luis. So on in the website, chapter by chapter, there's video clips that you can click on and you can see anything that's signed, you can see how it's done, right? For those who might be interested. Um, there's also a tab on the website that talks about deaf culture. She talked about things relative to sign language like how to use intonation when you're signing, the importance of body language and facial expression, the fact that there's actually dialects in sign language. People all the time ask, is there one universal sign? And not only is there not one universal sign, signs can be different in Philadelphia as they are in Texas or even Pittsburgh, right? I remember my mind was blown when I went out to IUP and found out soda was called pop, right? Well, it's very similar with sign language, right? In, in most of the country, this is birthday. In Philadelphia, this is birthday. Because in Philadelphia, you tug on your ear to say happy birthday, right? That's, so it's translated. So these things are discussed in these short video clips. They're not long. They're anywhere from 30 seconds to two minutes. Um, but in addition to that, there's a tab on the website, a buy now tab. And it will take you right to the Amazon page um, to purchase the book. And I really do encourage people to check it out. Um, and to share it because it is, a, I think, an important story and it is something that there's just a lack of good representation of these kids. Um, and it's not just diversity from the disability standpoint. Uh, you know, the five characters that are really highlighted in the book, all being sixth graders, um, one is Dominican, one is Puerto Rican, one is black, one is Pakistani, and then um, Ryan is uh, a white uh, student. So there's racial um, diversity within the book as well. So it really does try to hit on an awful lot of you know, what I think people are trying to find right now to bring into a classroom. Um, so yeah, I, and I think it's funny, and I think it's really well written, and I've been getting some really good feedback on it. You know, I, I pat myself in the back. I, as a self-published author, I was supposed to sell about 50 books from the research I've done, and I've done far better than that. There's really been a great response, in particular from, from people like me. I have social networks that are teachers of the deaf and hard of hearing, Facebook pages and things like that, and people have been just snapping it up because, like I said, there's just a lack of good content for um, this topic. So I'm hopefully finding a niche somewhere where I'm, I'm filling a void for those who, who need it and educating those who don't know anything about this. At the Intermediate Center, the, the book fair is going to be going on and students have been invited and sent a link to the website in order to purchase the book 
And those who do purchase the book can bring it to the book fair and get it personally signed by me. Um, I even have a little contest going where in the cover of the book you'll see that the, the, there's an image of Ryan and an image of Luis and they're in silhouette and Luis is signing this. And so I put a contest out that if the student could tell me what this sign means, they would get a free book. Uh, so I'm already getting responses uh, for that. But um, so yes, so we have a chance to meet the author, get a signing and get yourself a great story. Better Speech and Hearing Month is kind of all about, like I said, raising awareness of communication disorders, right? So if you have an articulation issue, right, that's obviously gonna be a communication barrier for you and, and, and people who are receiving speech therapy. It, it just kind of raises the awareness of, you know, um, for them talking about this issue, for people who don't know much about it, you know, to, to have a better understanding. And in particular for students with hearing loss, right, the things that we can do as hearing people to make communication easier on folks uh, by making sure you don't want to speak too slowly to somebody with a hearing loss but you also don't want to speak very quickly you want to make sure you are articulating you want to make sure you're not talking at the same time over people right so just sort of a way to to, to allow people who don't think about these communication barriers in their everyday life to be aware of it right so that when they do uh, engage with somebody uh, with a hearing loss that they have a better understanding of, of what they should do to make that communication process easier on those people. The American Speech Hearing Association has a lot of good resources. Ah, they are a group that um, provides a lot of um, educational resources for us as professionals, but there's a lot of good information out there on their website um, for people to kind of have a better understanding of um, communication disorders related to either speech or to hearing.